So welcome everyone. Um, you're welcome to the first um, IC webinar on gender and social inclusion. And for this webinar, we are focusing on how to mainstream gender and social inclusion in COVID-19 responses. Um, we have over 100 um, participants for this webinar, so we're very excited. And um, if you are not able to attend the whole webinar, don't worry. We'll make sure that the recording is available and shared to all of you so that you have access to it. So our panelists are in, uh, quite international and they come with a diverse range of experiences and from different parts of the world. Um, um, our first panelist is Professor Maya Onichan, who's a director of the Center of Reproductive Technologies and Health and also is at Sussex University. She'll be speaking about her experiences um, um, mainstreaming gender and the UK response and also her research related to COVID-19 and sexual and reproductive health. Um, she'll be followed after by um, Jorgen Mense, who is a disability and inclusion expert at the International Labour Organization. And he will sort of he'll be sharing his experiences of working with the ILO and um, thinking through issues around employment and how the COVID-19 pandemic has influenced access to employment and rights for people who live with disabilities. After that, we'll have a third panelist, which is Dr. Mukta Gadanya, who is a public health specialist based in Nigeria, and he will be sharing his experiences working in public health in Nigeria, and it will be followed shortly by Kerti who is a founder of the Gender Security Project, and she's going to talk about her experiences working on gender-based violence in India and sort of thinking about advocacy responses and interventions. So to start this webinar, I'm going to shortly share a slide presentation that's going to talk you through the focus areas and also um, the panelists and their expertise and what they will be speaking about today. Um, there will be an opportunity after the panelists have, have finished presenting to have questions and answers. Uh, there will be a question and answer sessions. So please post your questions um, to all the panelists and we will speak about them or we will touch on specific questions. There will also be opportunities for all participants to vote, um, vote on specific questions they want answered. And then um, the panelists will look through and sort of pick those questions and answer them as well. And if you have other issues after the webinar, if you have other questions you would like to talk about or discuss, you can also send that to my email, which was made available to you when you register. Let's start. So this webinar was um, came up because as a consulting, we figured that the COVID-19 pandemic was affecting, it's a, it's a global pandemic that affects everyone. But of course, um, marginalized populations are influenced or affected by the pandemic more than others. Um, it's affected many countries and many um, health systems in low middle income countries worse than it has in other um, settings and situations. So we decided to focus on a way to bring up these issues and think through how the responses to the pandemic can include issues around marginalization and how vulnerable populations and of course women and children are affected differently by the pandemic. This is the first of the webinar series and for this particular, um, particular webinar we'll be focusing on these thematic areas. So Professor Maya Unitan will be talking specifically on sexual and reproductive health. Um, Mr. Jorgen Menzel will be speaking about disability and social inclusion. And um, Mukta Gadaya will be talking about public health responses and health systems in Nigeria. And Kirti will be speaking about gender-based violence. Again, I've given you an overview of the main topics that the presenters will be focusing on for this webinar. Just to give you a brief overview of the expertise of the speakers, um, Professor Maya Unitan is a professor of social and medical anthropology at Sussex University. She's also a director of the Center for Cultures of Reproduction, Technologies and Health. 
Um, she holds degrees in sociology and economics, and she has been teaching at Sussex since 1991. She's particularly interested in the intersections between mobilities, migration, and global health, and especially the social implications and cultural underpinnings of global flows of ideas and technologies of reproduction health, health and rights. Um, she will introduce herself more when she's talking, um, taking us through her presentation, but um, it's good for you to know the overview of her expertise. Mr. Yoga Menzer is a Disability Inclusion Officer in the Gender Equality and Diversity Branch of the ILO. His responsibilities include the mainstreaming of disability issues into the International Labour Organization programming, development cooperation projects, internal policies, as well as practices. Um, Yoga Menzer is a big advocate of ensuring accessibility and inclusion of people living with disability. He will speak more about his experience during his presentation as well. Um, Dr. Mugda Adaya is an Associate Professor of Public Health and Honorary Consultant Public Phys and Physician. He consults widely for a lot of local and international governmental organizations and is also a partner at IC Consulting. He will speak through his experiences working in Nigeria and also mainstreaming gender and public health response, as well as health system strengthening. Um, Kirti Jayakuma is the founder of um, the Gender Security Progress um, Project. She's a feminist researcher and she works on gender peace and security. She's been involved in lots of advocacy efforts regarding gender-based violence and bringing, highlighting the effects the COVID-19 pandemic has had on increased gender-based violence in India and in many other countries. And she'll be talking us through some of her experiences during this webinar. Thank you. So now I am going to um, now I am going to let um, Maya um, start her presentation, and I'm going to mute myself. Thank you very much, uh, Emmy Lomo, and uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Maya Onithan, and um, can you hear me? Um, am I audible? Emmy Lomo, are you getting me? Okay, thanks. Um, so my name is Maya Onithan, as Emmy Lomo has introduced me. Uh, I'm a medical and social anthropologist, and I'm based at the University of Sussex. Um, in today's presentation, I'm actually going to focus on some of the gender and social inclusivity issues in the coronavirus responses in the UK, mainly um, to do with sexual and reproductive health services, that is to do with pregnancy, delivery, contraception, abortion. Um, I'll be drawing on some collective uh, research and submissions of evidence made by members of our uh, course research center, that's the Center for Cultures of Reproduction and Technologies um, at Sussex. Um, and I would like to share my screen, but it says you cannot share the screen until while another participant is sharing. So I would need to be enabled. Uh, um, so Emmy Lomo, if you could kindly enable me to share my screen. Hello. Okay. Uh, Emmy Lomo, if you can hear Maya. Uh, um, Oh, yes, I can. So I am going to um, share, move yeah. so that you can share your screen. Yes, it says that we have your screen on at the moment. So okay. Okay. that's disabling me from okay. um, sharing. So once your screen is off, I can share mine. Okay, great. Fantastic. Um, there you go. I am going to, what I'm going to do is um, I am going to put up your slides and then um, you can um, start. Yes. Okay. The only thing is if you put my slides up, I won't be able to sort of move them, but um, myself, but um, if you just, so, okay. okay. I'm not sure how this is going to work. But, okay. Yes. I'm doing um, that now. Wait. Um, there you go. 
There you go. So you can see. Sorry, Amy, I, I'm not able to um, see my screen. Um, and it, it says you're viewing Amy Lomo Oak Bay screen, so you cannot share your screen. Yes, I'm, I'm changing the settings now so you'll be able to okay. see my Don't worry. And I'm opening the slides as well while I um, Okay. While so I if we could that. have slide one, that would be great. Yes, it is. Great. It's, it's really an immense kind of pleasure to participate in, uh, in this uh, uh, sort of invitation of Amy Lomos and to engage with, with all of you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't actually see all your faces. So um, there's, no, there's no possibility of me seeing you, but um, I'm, I'm just very glad to be able to hear you later on in your questions and to engage with the other participants. Um, so as I was saying, thank you, Emmy. I've got the I've got the first slide up. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so as I was saying earlier, I will actually uh, in this presentation be drawing on you know collective research. So it's not just my research, but it's uh, research of um, everyone uh, who is interested in these issues within our Center for Cultures of Reproduction Technologies and Health, which is based at the University of Sussex, but. Um, uh, we have members uh, both nationally across the UK and also internationally um, who, are, who are active and who help us sort of, um, you know, uh, um, put together uh, these kinds of findings. So the two main, uh, the two main um, bits of work I'll be referring to um, are the submissions of research evidence that we presented to um, the Women and Equalities Committee inquiry into the unequal impact of coronavirus. Um, 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 and, and the other piece uh, we are, that I'll be drawing on will be the submission of research evidence on inquiry into the access to contraception, which was submitted to the all party parliamentary group on sexual reproductive health in the UK on the 22nd of June. And um, it's important you have this, um, you know, the, these two links here because uh, this is something, uh, this is where you'd get also all the references um, to, to some of the things that I'll be, I'll be mentioning. Um, so if we could have the next slide. So um, thank you. So getting back then to um, the, um, the, the focus of, of today's um, meeting, um, which is on gender mainstreaming and social inclusivity in COVID-19 responses. What I'm going to do is I have 15 minutes. So I'm going to just draw out some kind of key issues that uh, have struck me and have come out from our joint collective work as we submitted it um, to, uh, to for, for this, you know, in terms of research, this research evidence. So what I think one of the kind of key things that that is useful to uh, keep in, you know, to really keep at the forefront is uh, that you know, in, in, this notion, in this context of gender mainstreaming and social inclusivity, um, uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important really to keep human rights and a justice approach right at the forefront. And this is because often in pandemics, it is easy to overlook, um, overlook some of these um, sort of key principles of human rights. Um, that, you know, we, human rights means that um, we have to have, everyone has to have equal uh, access to health services. Um, these are services that uh, have to be holistic. Uh, they must cover, you know, not just health issues, but also social and cultural issues. Um, they must, you know, it, everyone should be able to participate. It should be inclusive. That's this whole thing about social inclusivity. Um, and whatever is provided is, uh, you know, people need to be accountable in terms of governance issues. They need to be accountable and transparent in terms of their guidelines. Um, and of course, you know, above all else, everyone needs, uh, a, you know, access to acceptable and high quality services. So it's really important to keep, um, you know, human rights principles in the forefront, uh, especially when we're thinking about gender and main mainstreaming and social inclusivity issues. And beyond human rights, I think we also need to keep in mind reproductive justice, um, uh, you know, uh, 
paradigms in, in mind. And this is because reproductive justice is an important framework, uh, particularly in contexts where you know, people might not know of or be fearful of accessing the law um, and accessing those human rights standards through the law. So it is really important that, that we keep, we have this kind of combined approach uh, of thinking about human rights, but also sort of a justice approach. Um, the other, the other kind of key issue um, that has emerged in in whatever uh, material that that we've looked at in uh, in the center is that there are uh, uh, there are huge gender and intersectional data gaps. So so there is a gender data gap, and and um, the thing is that these these gaps are there um, uh, in any case, but they become really highlighted in in. Uh, the, the the pandemic and particularly in pandemic res, uh, responses. So, for example, uh, you know the the paucity of research, the lack of research on women's um, uh, differential experiences of disease and suffering, um, uh, which is there before, is now seen to be much more um, sort of uh, in, in the forefront. Um, this is because we've seen that you know perhaps women and men, and in, uh, you know they they might have very different um, sort of um, uh, the, the prevalence of, of uh, COVID-19 uh, would be very different in them. And for that, we do, we do need to uh, have that framework to investigate uh, these, these kinds of um, issues. Secondly, um, you know, the, the gender data gaps lead to, uh, they're very important because they, uh, you know, a lot of the design of the tools, uh, the kinds of equipment that's used for, for, for example, for healthcare providers, uh, this, this is uh, based on this kind of research of, you know, the different differential gender needs. So, for example, we've seen where, you know, uh, uh, healthcare providers who are women, most of the visors and the protective apparel has been uh, designed for men, and 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 this doesn't fit women, and particularly. In context of COVID-19, we see that this really increases the risk for uh, healthcare providers if they are not well well protected. Um, so, can we go to the uh, can we go further down or to the next slide? Thank you. Um, then, uh, of course, the uh, another key issue um, that it has emerged is really about the timing um, and and you know when when. Uh, do institutions and when do um, uh, you know organizations uh, respond uh, to the, to the pandemic? In what ways do they respond? And what what we found is that it, it's very important to have you know an early engagement um, in uh, with with what's happening and also. Uh, sort of translating that engagement and and research into guidelines early on, and then for these guidelines to be continuously kind of updated and monitored. Um, and, and in that sense, we, uh, you know, we found that um, the um, guidelines provided by the Royal College of Gynecologists and the Royal College of uh, Midwives have been uh, really quite exemplary uh, in the UK. Um, they uh, right from, you know, from, from early briefings um, and, and uh, excellent guidelines from, you know, uh, say, say the 9th of April and consistently from then weekly, monthly, uh, we have had uh, good briefings in terms of, um, you know, what both to healthcare providers, what, what they should be doing, but also information being set out for, um, uh, for women and men uh, as well. Um, so, for example, early research um, that was collected and disseminated through the RCOG on which their guidelines were based was really um, things like in pregnancy, for example, the idea that, you know, pregnant women may not be, you know, the difference between pregnant and non-pregnant women in terms of risk isn't, uh, isn't very significant, isn't there. Uh, but there is an increase in risk for women later on in their pregnancies in the in the third sort of uh, in the uh, third trimester. Um, similarly, um, I you know the idea about of uh, research that um, was was tentative but uh, has been um, uh, highlighted is that there might be some forms of sort of uh, vertical tr transmission taking place. Uh, women may be pregnant women 
and, and children may be at risk of that. So either sort of in the antenatal period, the transmission of the virus from uh, mothers to the, the fetus, or in the postnatal period between the mother and the child, uh, there may be some risk of, of that. That uh, was um, already kind of highlighted in these guidelines. Uh, similarly, uh, the idea that actually the uh, risk of women who are pregnant increases when there are other comor comorbidities along with the pregnancy, if you are suffering from other kinds of um, uh, ailments, um, and you know, such as uh, they, they mentioned, you know, diabetes, um, uh, etc., and a, you know, any other kinds of kind of ailments. Um, the the and, and one of the important findings has also been about how these comorbidities seem to be more prevalent in um, women from um, ethnic minorities. Um, so these, these research findings have been both highlighted and acted upon uh, early on by the uh, Royal College of Gynecologists and, and midwives, and they were available for people to uh, connect up with. So could we have the next slide then? <clears throat> Um, the, the other um, sort of uh, finding that we, we have had is that, um, you know, in terms of um, service, service access and the issues to do with how people access services, access sexual and reproductive health uh, services. Um, and of course, this has been dominated by the provision of online, on uh, services online. But then also thinking about um, how and and you know with the the re, um, the um, uh, college uh, re, Royal College of Gynecologists and and of midwives, but also the Faculty for Sexual Reproductive Health and Medicine in the UK have been very reflective on on this issue uh, and think about both the opportunities, of course, with online provision, but also their limits. Um, so, for example, in terms of antenatal care and birth, you know, the, the, the issue about um, how uh, the, the move to online may have exacerbated the delay in accessing care, uh, and to what extent also does, does it mitigate the fears and anxieties of, of, of women and, and men who can't access antenatal care. Um, so, the, you know, the, and, and does... does um, even the fact that you can't access care face to face, but just that does that uh, prevent you from uh, from uh, accessing adequate information? Um, and but it's also it's also the fact that you know health services are overwhelmed, and so women might actually experience delays, health system delays in in access to these kind of uh, emergency or comprehensive obstetric services. Um, uh, another really important factor in terms of these fears and anxieties are that um, there is and there has, you know, um, this, this restricted access particularly um, uh, is becomes even more so for people in self-isolation during the COVID lockdown process. And these issues combined can increase depression, you know, uh, both in, in the postpartum context, but also in the perinatal context. Um, and so it is really important to have psychosocial support um, and, and, and often, you know, policy and program responses uh, are, are kind of linked to emergency and critical events and not necessarily sort of focused on these kind of mental health responses. So that is, that is really um, important. So can we go a bit um, um, lower in the slide, uh, Emmy? Emmy Lomo, thank you. Could we go, could we just see the rest of the slide, Emmy Lomo, the one that's, um, sorry, no. I, I seem to have lost the, I seem to have lost the screen now. Um, but I see, yes, the, 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 the other point is really about um, some of the options that have been given to women delivering in health services, uh, you know, in, in um, institutions and in hospitals. And we see, for example, um, could um, that um, so? So I'll come to this slide in a minute. But I'm just finishing the other slide, which is about you know, how in hospital settings, uh, women have been uh, enabled to have uh, a a birth partner with them, and this is really important uh, because birth partners are 
you know, important for emotional support, they're important for communication. Um, and uh, the RCOG guidelines say that an asymptomatic birth partner, single asymptomatic birth partner uh, uh, is to be allowed uh, with, with women um, as they give birth. Sorry, we move to the next slide then. So along with these service issues, I just talked about the ones relating to birth, but they're also really important one, um, service issues relating to the access to contraception and the access to abortion. Uh, these are sort of, um, you know, major, major issues in um, ensuring uh, reproductive and particularly sexual health. So they are very uh, Im important. Uh, with, with contraception, um, we found that there's been a speedy switch to phone consultations and transmission of online prescription in the UK. And this is for most of the contraceptives, except for long acting reversible contraceptives. Again, um, what, what um, the experience has been is that it's very difficult for those who are self isolating to uh, have access because often while you get the online prescription, uh, you have to go to the pharmacies uh, themselves uh, to um, to access this. So you, you might have the prescription, you might have the consultation, but then the actual access it might be difficult for those who are self-isolating. Um, similarly, not all services, um, you know, not all sort of primary health care trusts, etc., have uh, have been able to provide online services. So there's been a rapid commissioning also of online service organizations, which has taken place. There were tender frameworks set out. So a lot of work has, has gone into that. Um, with, you know, a key issue with these online, on, the online provision has been that often, and this is again, you need things in place before such pandemics break out, but there's been really a lack of, um, you know, uh, sensitive tools to collect information from groups who uh, already have uh, difficulties in accessing contraceptives. Uh, and that, so when you have online services, you know, it's very, it's very essential and not much work has gone into that yet to ensure that it is, it is addressing the needs of, of people from different, um, uh, you know, British, uh, so from different black and minority ethnic communities, because one of the things have been found recently in the research is that there is a lower level of uh, uptake of, of, and particularly repeat, repeat prescriptions among uh, BME service users. Um, very briefly, and you know, most of these points I elaborated in the research submission and in the do uh, the documents I mentioned earlier on um, at the start of the at the start of the talk. So I I will just um, um, thank you. Yes. So I will just um, go, the the references are here. There's you know, and and the different people who've contributed to this are all mentioned in their research. So uh, I'm not going into that in detail. Um, so apart from a contraception and access to contraception services, we also uh, uh, access to um, abortion services has been uh, very important. And sorry, can we go back to that slide, uh, Emmy Lomo? Thank you. Um, so it's, yes, thank you. So if we, it's the next, uh, the next slide, please. And the next one. And the next one. Thank you. So if we uh, look at the abortion services, um, we found that actually something rather dramatic and, 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 and um, I, would, I would suggest very good has happened with um, the move to online services and that for the first time uh, we find that online services have been organized for complete early medical abortion with counseling. Um, and, and this has uh, also been kind of, I mean, in a sense, it's, it, it, it's part of the guidelines. Um, and this for the first time, there is an acknowledgement that women can actually self-manage their own abortions at home. Uh, this is supported by, you know, uh, uh, medical and treatment packages sent through the post. So again, it's very important for that we've had the, you know, maintenance of postal services during the pandemic. Um, and and um, in, it, it has also shown that, you know, we, that the certification um, of, of, of having abortions, that 
huge barrier um, has also been um, addressed because now this can take place through, uh, through, through online means and this has been um, you know, accepted. Uh, however, um, there is, you know, uh, as yet the support and in, uh, for the um, access of sort of ethnic minorities in terms of abortion as well as contraception is 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 yet to be sort of developed. And I think part of this issue is is also to do with the fact that these communities um, um, have not had. Uh, support for access, uh, special support in terms of their uh, access uh, for abortion and contraception, because among some of the research that um, we did uh, in the UK, uh, we found that particularly access to abortion information and contraception was very poor um, and, and um, really needed special sort of development in, in uh, ethnic minority communities. Um, we work spe specifically with South, South Asian, uh, Pakistani, Indian, uh, and Bangladeshi uh, communities um, and found this to be the case. Um, and then I guess, you know, the, the final point that I really um, want to put across um, is that we've been talking a lot about, you know, face to face. Uh, we've been talking a lot about um, uh, the face-to-face -face versus online and online as being this kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, great um, sort of panacea um, for uh, helping us in this, in this pandemic. But, um, and it has to a lot, large extent with abortion, we find this specifically so. Um, but I, I think one of the things we forget is that it's not only about face-to-face -face and online, it's also about issues to do with touch and physical contact. And we have lost that in the pandemic. We have lost uh, that, um, that, that kind of contact, which is so important uh, for, for healing uh, and for emotional well-being. So I'm going to stop at that and I look forward to your, to your comments. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Maya, for that very good presentation, which was very holistic and comprehensive. And I, I really like the fact that you talked about some of the vulnerabilities that ethnic minorities face. And you also talked about some of the mental health effects of COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think it was a very interesting presentation and I'm going to, I'm going to sort of keep some of the points um, that you've raised as some of the key issues. So later to the question and answer session, and I'll be looking for specific questions raised by the participants that we'll discuss much later after all the panelists have presented. Um, so thank you again for that very insightful and thoughtful um, presentation. So the next panelist that will speak is Mr. Jorgen Mense. Um, Mr. Jorgen Mense is a disability and social inclusion expert for the International Labour Organization based in Geneva. And he will um, run through his experiences and as well as the ILO response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think now you should be able to share your screen. I uh, have sorted out the glitch we had before. Okay, great. Great, that's working then? Yes, it's working. Okay, thank perfect. You. Thank you very much, Emilomo. Um, yeah, thank you very much for giving me the slot now and um, overall just inviting us at the International Labour Organization to um, talk a little bit about what has happened in the disability um, community um, ever since the pandemic started. And uh, before I'll talk about the response to COVID-19, just a few basic reminders or what I've called here the 21st century reminders about persons with disabilities. As we know, concepts uh, and perspectives keep on changing. Um, but it's important that we we all on the same page when we talk about the concept of disability, uh, persons with disabilities. So that's why I, I, I felt it was important to have this, let's say, opening slide. So just a reminder that um, sometimes we call it the, the biggest minority in the world, according to the um, World Disability Report. 
about 15% of the world population have one or, or more um, disabilities. And it's a very heterogeneous group, of course, because we have men, women, transgender people with disabilities. We have people with disabilities of diverse races and ethnicities, of course, it's different ages. You can be born with a disability or you acquire a disability in teenage years or in old age. Then, of course, the disability itself or the impairment um, is very different, right? You can have a sensory um, disability like being blind or, or deaf, hard of hearing. You can have a physical disability that's, uh, for example, an amputee. Um, you can have an intellectual disability like Down syndrome or a psychosocial disability. And we just heard in the um, the presentation before that, of course, mental health issues are on the rise during this this pandemic. Um, there again, I, I, may, I have I, I just realized I've aged twice here um, uh, on the slide. Anyway, so old age, young age, uh, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status. Of course, there are many many other factors that uh, could be considered when we think about um, the identity of a person. Well, there on the right hand side of the slide, you see also, of course. Religion is also such a factor. Anyways, just to keep in mind that it is not a, um, oftentimes when people think about people with disabilities, the first thing that comes to mind is, is a male uh, wheelchair user. And of course, the, the group of people with disabilities is as diverse as uh, a society. Then important, of course, that um, in 2006, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, was adopted, and this is, uh, so to say, the, the, the most uh, comprehensive legal framework we have in the area of disability rights, because it spells out uh, the human rights of people with disabilities, which they always had, of course, um, but they were not uh, clearly defined or not in a, such a comprehensive global framework, and it has been ratified by almost all countries within a few number few number a uh, few, few years actually when you think about it usually these uh, ratifications take take much longer but all member states of the united nations felt this was a topic that has been overlooked for too long then when we talk about disability and that's actually going back to the first point 15% of world population so who is actually defined as having a disability who is a person with a disability and who is not and in fact these statistics are always a bit tricky because you can have a very um, um, strict cutoff uh, or more relaxed so to say and that would always of course um, bring <clears throat> down or up the number of people with disabilities in a more conceptual way we can say and that's uh, taken from the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that disability results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers where more simple formula could be impairment plus barriers equals disability so we move away from an individual approach to disability where we say look the 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 challenge is within the person no we we move it to the society to the societal context the environment that needs to be accessible that needs to be inclusive and that's that's a so the social model of disability as we call it and then the last point on this slide just to um, uh, remind ourselves that the um, um, agenda for sustainable development 2030 explicitly refers to persons with disabilities unlike the millennium development goals where were totally that were absent uh, where disability was totally absent so now as the SDGs as the, the global development framework we have a number of references explicitly um, talking about person with disabilities and concrete targets on how to bring person with disabilities better into the development framework, including in the area of employment. Since I work at the International Labour Organization and our team promotes the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the labour market and in so social protection schemes, this is a um, bit of the focus of my presentation. When the, when the pandemic started, it was um, really, well, it was interesting. Well, interesting is a word that doesn't say much, but it was um, great, actually. It was really great to see that 
um, well, organizations of persons with disabilities, OPDs, then NGOs working for the rights of persons with disabilities, but also UN entities uh, like the ILO. I haven't listed here the ILO, but we have another slide on that. They ca all came up with very quickly with statements and guidance on how to make sure that the response to the COVID, the immediate response at least, would be inclusive of persons with disabilities. And that's, of course, essentially, essential because we have heard before, if we don't um, bring marginalized group, groups into the design of responses from the, from the very beginning, they are forgotten. And despite all these um, statements and, and guidance from the disability community and NGOs and, and UN entities, of course, it's, it's unfortunate that still in many contexts, people with disabilities don't enjoy the, uh, the same rights when it comes to the COVID-19 response. So we see, and uh, I hope we can share the presentations after this webinar, so they, ha yeah, they will have all the hyperlinks to the different guidance documents, but that's, that's uh, just a selection of, the, of some of the most important ones. You also see the World Health Organization here because many of you might be working in the health area and just um, to mention that, of course, that the challenge a person with disabilities face that uh, those who, who contracted COVID or the coronavirus, that some of them even um, did not get access to the, to, the med to the medical care they would have needed because, again, the life, the worth of the life of a person with disability was put in question. If a doctor had to treat somebody without a disability or somebody with a disability, it was more likely that a person with a disability would be sent back home. So this is obviously a very um, um, direct discrimination, which could have, could and did lead to, to death among people with disabilities during the outbreak. And still, of course, during the un ongoing pandemic. And we know that, and, and that's why we also here in the webinar talking about marginalized groups, groups that are at higher risk of uh, vulnerability, and people with disabilities are, are such a group. As we said, it's, very, uh, it's a very heterogeneous group. But looking at some, I mean, I'm just picking here one example of um, employment to population ratio, right? The employees. So what is the ratio of people? Um, employed compared to the overall general population. And when you then disaggregate this data by persons with disabilities and persons without disabilities, and then uh, adding this layer of um, disaggregation by, by sex, so we have women with disabilities, men with disabilities, women, women without disabilities, men without disabilities, and you see in all regions of the world and i think except for europe we have countries here on this slide from all regions you see that it's always the the persons with disabilities who have a lower employment to population ratio so they are less likely to actually be employed and these statistics come not uh come not from this year or from years before. So we know, of course, that persons with disabilities came into the COVID-19 crisis already uh, disadvantaged in the labor market and, of course, in uh, many other areas of, of social life. This is um, just one example from Uganda where the International Disability NGO Light for the World, uh, together with the radio station, conducted a survey in uh, what it say here in April, end of April. Um, so a few weeks after the pandemic had been, had, had become global, so to say. And it was not really the access to health at that point that was uh, worry, worrying for, for people with disabilities, um, but mostly the question, how do I feed myself? How do I feed my, my uh, family? Because, you know, in many places of the world, the economy was shut down. And um, so the, the people with disabilities, like many other people, um, could not make an income, or still cannot. So the, the biggest concern was actually not getting access to medical care or even being in, infected by the virus. You see here, it's like uh, the, the concern that was least 
uh, in um, least worrisome, so to say, but it was really the economic impact of the lockdown and the recession that's, that's likely to follow. It's really, how do I feed my family? And here's some um, quotes from uh, two women, in uh, one in Bangladesh and one in Kenya. This was a survey done uh, by the Innovation to Inclusion program funded by the UK government operating in Bangladesh and Kenya. Just to give you a bit of a um, more human uh, face of what it means for persons with disabilities. And Salma in Bangladesh said, I'm very, very worried about my job security. The dress factory where I work as a sewing machine operator is fully closed. If I lose my job, I will be treated as a burden of my family. It relates to the fact that, you know, even if people with disabilities get a job, they are the likely to be the ones losing the job first. Esther in Kenya said, we were dismissed on the basis that we shall spread the virus faster than those without disabilities. The reason was that we use our hands to support ourselves. We are also not able to reach the taps when washing hands. So the first part of her statement shows that there's this disability-based stereotype that just because you have a disability, um, you're more likely to well, contract and spread the virus. And then the second or the last sentence here, we are also not able to reach the taps when washing hands shows that accessible environments are just not there, right? In, 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 um, in companies, but also when it comes to basic sanitary um, uh, services. So when we then think about what happens in the recovery, so the, of course the lockdown happened in, in most countries and that uh, very much affected, of course, the economy, and the livelihoods of, of everybody, including people with disabilities. And then there was an assessment done, um, I think that might have been May or June this year, um, where an initial assessment of 19 na um, national plans were done and looking at uh, how much they included people with disabilities and their needs. And um, the pie chart there on the right shows you that almost half of them were absent. Uh, that they, they, I mean, absent of uh, disability issues, so they didn't mention person with disabilities at all. And then uh, around yeah, 37 percent they mentioned people with disabilities, but together with a number of other um, marginalized groups. Then about 11 percent, um, so that's um, two countries, they mentioned people with disabilities explicitly, um, but didn't have any concrete recommendations on, on how to address their needs. And only one country in this initial assessment um, had in, in its uh, socioeconomic recovery plan explicit reference to persons with disabilities and recommendations on how to um, address the needs of persons with disabilities. So obviously this is a huge gap and oversight in the design of these plans. And I'll just, um, and, and I hope you can uh, get this presentation afterwards so you can um, re read it for yourself. But just um, six points that I think uh, are effective approaches we have seen now. Um, and that, that's basically even more important during the pandemic, but that of course it has been um, true for even before. Um, the involvement of persons with disabilities and their respective organization, that's always key. Whenever you design a policy, uh, when you design a program, you need to have the voices of persons with disabilities represented so their needs are appropriately reflected and can be addressed. And that's the, the same is true, of course, in the, in the design of COVID-19 responses. All the responses or solutions, of course, they need to make sure that human rights are respected and equality is promoted so people with disabilities enjoy equal um, access to whatever it may be in the area of work um, and with, with, a, with, a, with a move to, to telework from home, it's clear that uh, employers need to provide the reasonable adjustment, the reasonable accommodations for the workers with disabilities so they can do their job from home as effectively as they can, could have done it 
um, from their offices or from their, if, if of course, if telework is, is possible, it's not uh, possible in all industries. Communication, um, there are two points about communication. Obviously, communication needs to be provided in an accessible format. Um, that could be, for example, sign language for sign language users, mostly deaf people, subtitles, accessible websites, and so on. Um, and also easy to read, um, easy to read communication for people who might have an intellectual disability. And the communication itself should not only be accessible, but it should also um, refer to the particular situation of persons with disabilities in the current pandemic. The second slide on effective approaches, social protection is obviously key and many countries, many governments have uh, used social protection at the very beginning of the pandemic to kind of uh, alleviate the impact, the socioeconomic impact on, on uh, certain groups, including persons with disabilities, where um, direct um, cash transfers happened or um, um, money where money was just wired um, to to beneficiaries so that that helped but obviously that um, cannot be a one-time thing it needs to be sustainable and um, and social protection can help but it needs to be designed in a way that a person with disabilities uh, are not um, tied to a disability benefit instead of going to work right so a, a disability benefit should always be um, flexible enough to accommodate the income person with disabilities would uh, generate by by working and not be penalized by 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 having a job um, then the second point here visible disability in data and reporting of course what is what is not measured cannot be improved in, in many uh, statistics, people with disabilities, let alone women and I mean, uh, let alone a disaggregation by, by sex, um, is not happening. So we don't even know what the situation of persons with disabilities is like. Um, so we always need to push for disaggregation of data by disability, including, of course, in the labor market um, and also in reports, obviously. And the last point here is there's this um, OECD uh, DAC, so the Development Assistance Committee, and it has it since, like, I think last year or the year before, I'm not even sure right now, but they have a disability marker. And with this, this, this disability marker, uh, development partners, donors, can actually track how much of their funding is used for promoting the rights of persons with disabilities. And in the current pandemic, it would be advisable to also use this market to see what actually happens with the funds we use to address the COVID-19 crisis from a disability perspective. Then one thing that I would like just to, to share because uh, a lot of time I also spent um, in supporting the ILO Global Business and Disability Network, which is a coming together of 12, 25 uh, global companies more than 30 national networks of disability inclusive companies and we did a survey um, just to understand what they were doing how they were reacting to the crisis from a disability perspective and well not so surprisingly but just to to uh, show you the the top three measures taken by companies that employ people with disabilities obviously these are not only disability specific measures they usually would apply to um all workers or the majority of workers it's telework uh flexible working hours and paid leave here um maybe if you watch the recording just uh, hit the pause button or if you have the presentation you can also click on the links here in this slide you will find the key um, resources the key guidance we have developed here in the international labor organization for um, employers, trade unions, governments, and organizations working on disability rights on how to promote a more disability inclusive COVID-19 response. And with this, um, I would like to end my presentation and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jürgen, um, for that um, fantastic 
fantastic presentation. I think it really brought up a um, lot of key issues that people living with disabilities face in terms of access to employment and also discrimination um, in regards of the in regards or in relation to the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, I think it was also interesting that you brought out case studies from specific countries and put a voice to some of the issues that people living with disabilities face. I see we have one question already about, about um, um, beta differences um, in India, I think regarding gender and some of the issues around access to employment. So I would encourage the participants to keep posting their questions. Um, we'll come back to them at, at the end of all the presentations. So um, now I would like to invite our next presenter. Um, his name is Dr. Mukta Gandanya. He is, uh, Mukta Gandanya is a partner at ISEC Consulting. He's a public health specialist with over um, 14 years experience working in health system strengthening and development. He's also on the Ethics Review Board of Mary Stokes International. Um, so now I will let him speak about the experiences of responding to COVID-19 in Nigeria and also talking about some of the issues around gender mainstream. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amy Lomo, and uh, thanks so much. Uh, I found insightful the presentation by uh, Maria and Jurgen, and I hope I'm going to build on some of the issues they say. And the topic for my presentations today is mainstreaming gender in COVID-19 response, uh, drawing lessons uh, from Nigeria. As Amy said, uh, my name is Dr. Mokhtar Gedenya. I'm part of the IC Consulting. And this is a brief outline about how my presentation is, is going to uh, progress. I'm going to briefly talk about COVID-19 epidemiology in Nigeria as it relates to gender, including showing how COVID-19 affects men most, but affects women most. So the contrast, infection men, affectation women. And then I'm going to briefly discuss lessons about uh, gender mainstreaming for COVID-19 in Nigeria, especially the health system uh, response. And this is going to be uh, very, brief for those who don't know Nigeria, an African, West African country, uh, a population of over 200 million. That's about three times the population of the United Kingdom and about 60% of the population of the United States with population density per kilometer in the range of 300 to 400 persons per square kilometer, uh, which is variable uh, between regions. And then we are enabled to uh, largely Francophone countries, uh, Niger, Chad, Cameroon, Benin, and Togo. And in terms of brief gender epidemiology for COVID in Nigeria, the data I'm showing are from the midnight of 1st September, 2020. So this data has been less than 72 hours uh, old. Uh, diagnosis of 34,522 males, constituting about 64% of all uh, confirmed COVID cases in Nigeria, with about 36% uh, complementary value for females. And as you can see from uh, what looks like a population pyramid, largely an infection in males. So people may argue, uh, if you are mainstreaming, what should be your em emphasis? Is it to emphasize on males or females? And we know bulk of the disposition by the male gender relates to uh, hormonal situation. Our data has shown that uh, anti-male hormone drugs like dudesteride and tamsulacin have significant value in reducing males' disposition to COVID. And we know that uh, there's a Galvin phenomena where US physician was confirmed alopecia from hyperandrogenism had a severe case of COVID. So most of the vulnerability for males arise from 
biological and physiological disposition. Uh, and in terms of how COVID affects women more uh, globally and in Nigeria, we know in Nigeria women are making significant contribution to COVID-19 response, not only in Nigeria, in the US, for example. But uh, as Maya, Maya said, there are long-standing inequalities, which are now exacerbated by uh, COVID, the pandemic, leading to bigger hit on women uh, arising from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We know that in Nigeria uh, and globally, gender-based violence is on the rise, including online uh, violence. And in Nigeria, gender mainstreaming has only now been explicitly art articulated in the states and the national response plans, with earlier interventions uh, fragmented and not synergized. So they are now being uh, explicitly captured, uh, gender mainstreaming. Earlier before now, uh, most of the interventions were by partners and a little intervention by government in a non-synergized and in a fragmented uh, approach. And these uh, interventions relate to hotlines and services for gender-based violence, for survivors of gender-based uh, violence who may be isolated, who are usually isolated with their abusers, and it becomes more pronounced uh, when people are under lockdown, so that abuse can go on for 24 hours or more than when there is no lockdown. And the abuse probably only goes on in the evening or for when the two partners are around. And there is no, at the moment, there are plans to create COVID-19 specific stimulus plans to build women economic empowerment. Uh, before now, such plans are not existing. Uh, in Nigeria, especially in southwestern Nigeria, women are over represented in informal work, and they are among those people who tend to have incomes accruing on a daily basis. And uh, globally, and this too uh, resonates in Nigeria, we know that there was a current disruption to logistics, current disruption to sexual and reproductive health services, it was estimated that about 47 million family planning clients may lose access to modern contraception if the current situation persists for six months. And this could result in global 15 million additional unintended pregnancies and unintended, unintended pregnancies potentially leading to unsafe abortions uh, with implications for maternal morbidity and mortality. And these are data from Nigeria's National Routing Health Management Information System, uh, anchored on the DHIS2, has shown consistent uh, decline for most of the contraceptive commodities, most marked for injectables, uh, which in the first four months of their decline from the uptake decline from what it was in January before COVID became a big issue in Nigeria. It was about 270,000 in January, declining to under 200,000 by end of April, uh, with lower level of decline for implants, uh, the uptake, and then uh, slightly lower level of uptake of IUCDs. Uh, this is based on the programming by the health sector that when outreaches are conducted, uh, still respecting women's sexual and reproductive rights, but then promoting as much as possible long acting reversible contraceptives, which are going to uh, foster the COVID response and allowing for lower need for healthcare workers' resources. And we saw in Nigeria decline in the capacity of the healthcare system to train healthcare workers on general family planning methods and on delivery of long-acting reversible contraceptives. 
So compared to the same period last year, uh, January, April in 2019, compared to January, April in the current year, we saw substantial decline in number of providers trained for all kinds of uh, activities related to family planning. Last year, for the same period, over 4,000 healthcare workers trained. But for the current year, only about 300 trained. And for training for long actual reversible contraceptives, it was about a quarter of what was achieved last year. And in fewer states in the current year than uh, in last year, as you can see from our left side. And what has been the national response to uh, what I described earlier? Nigeria stakeholders anchored by the government effort aim to ensure women don't face more structural inequality due to COVID-19. And there was a realization and effort to implement the following protection of essential health and support services, especially as they relate to primary health care and sexual and reproductive health services. And the realization and increasing process of operationalization of the need to support and listen to women in the front line, the women who are responding to uh, the epidemic, for example, community-based distributors of uh, contraceptives in Nigeria. And then because of the large engagement of women uh, as a proportion in the informal economic sector and in the daily income category, it was realized that there is need to build women's economic resilience so that they will be able to survive uh, periods, uh, the rainy days uh, periods. And then increasingly the system uh, as at August and September is uh, increasingly including women and women's organization in decision making. So uh, getting women and women's organization to contribute to programming as they relate to gender mainstreaming for medical and social social economic programming, including for the recovery uh, period. And the major lesson learned by the Nigerian stakeholders is to, from the beginning, start mainstreaming for gender, for disability, as Urigen mentioned, from the outset, uh, everyone was panicking. So the response initially was not as holistic as now uh, stakeholders are planning to be more inclusive for disability, for gender, uh, for minority uh, status, and for other uh, conditions which would foster for equality and then contribute uh, to a better response and then better containment of COVID in Nigeria. And COVID has been uh, recognizing Nigeria as a big health, developmental, and socioeconomic challenge. Nigeria is largely a mono economy, and a lot of people, as I mentioned, women in, in particular, in the informal sector with daily incomes. So there was a huge, huge disruption to the macro economy and to the micro economy as it relates to the average woman and man uh, on the street. And so this is a summary of my presentation for people who are willing to uh, read additionally on the issue regarding gender inclusion in Nigeria. Uh, this is uh, my bibliography list, uh, largely available uh, online. And for the ones which are not available, if you consult uh, IC consulting, uh, we are going to be able to supply them. And thank you so much, everyone, for finding time to attend this uh, webinar. And I hope to, uh, to be able to offer clarif clarifications uh, or request. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, back to you, uh, Amy. Um, thank you very much, Mukta, for that presentation. I um, 
I appreciate the fact that you talked about the different effects that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on men and women. And also you talked about the health issues, but also about the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic on a lot of women and vulnerable groups. And I think that is an important thing that you've highlighted and it's good to take into account, not just public health issues, but how social determinants of health, vulnerability, socioeconomic status can influence access. I see there's some more interesting questions in the question and answer sessions, which we'll get to very shortly. Um, our next speaker is um, Kati Jayakumar. Um, Kati Jayakumar is a, is a peace activist, is a um, communicator, a writer, um, um, an advocate for um, for women and human rights issues. And also she is the founder of the Gender Security Project, um, um, which I hope you will look at after this um, webinar, which focuses on preventing gender-based um, violence and encourages people to share their experiences through podcasts and share um, advocacy efforts. So Kerti is now going to talk about her experiences um, responding to gender-based violence in India and some of the work she's been doing with the Gender Security Project. Um, please, um, participants, stay on. Um, immediately after Kerti's presentation, we'll go to the question and answer session, where you'll be able to interact directly with the um, panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Emilomo, and uh, special thanks to all of the speakers for enlightening and educating us on the respective topics you talked about. Um, I am not going to make a presentation. I'm instead going to speak a little bit because a lot of what I'm sharing is anecdotal. A lot of the research is still underway to understand the extent of data and the extent of violence that's prevailed against women, against people of non-binary gender identities across the world during lockdowns because of COVID. So my presentation is largely going to center on how we responded to gender-based violence through a couple of anecdotes, and then go on to make a very compelling case for the need to employ, I hope what would be a very compelling case, to, for the need to employ gender mainstreaming strategies in responding to instances of gender-based violence and increased instances at that during times such as a pandemic. So I live and work in India, and I run a foundation and initiative called the Gender Security Project which works at the cross-section of the Women, Peace and Security agenda through research, reportage and documentation. When the lockdowns began in my country, we went through what is globally known, so far as my understanding permits, is one of the strictest lockdowns uh, with the inception of COVID in the country. Now, this lockdown began with a 21-day complete closure of the entire country, which meant that absolutely nothing was functioning as per normal. And then following that, there were several degrees with which parts of the country began to open up and several states continued to lock down. So the experiences of women in India cannot be homogenized to one, neither can the experiences of non-binary people. So I'm going to try to give you as many examples of what actually transpired over these six months since the lockdown began. So when India went on the lockdown, we saw two different kinds of violence unfold, as is the case across the world. But one set of one form of violence was structural violence, where with the structures and systems in place, uh, several communities that um, are already unfairly disadvantaged continued to actually face greater disadvantages. And these included women and non-binary people. What happened with the lockdown was a massive mass migrant crisis, which caused for people to leave cities and go walking to their home country, hometowns and home uh, villages in search of what they call home. Because urban living in India does not have place for migrant labor during times like a pandemic, where people have been forced to live in very densely populated areas and social distancing and physical distancing became the norm, to live and continue to live in what was considered a temporary home was no longer feasible. And with the migrant crisis, a hidden and unaddressed crisis to date continued in the form of increased domestic violence, increased gender-based violence, both in the form of overt as well as covert violence. So along with this, with structural violence, there was also increased cultural violence. We noticed an increase in instances of child marriage. We noticed an increase in instances of FGM, or female genital mutilation, even if it was for a specific community alone. We also noticed an instance uh, increase in marital rape, 
increase in honor-based violence and culture-based violence, such as forced marriages. There was an increase in the domestic burden on women as well, essentially because the whole idea of work from home did not change the reality that the domestic burden had to continue to be borne by women. With the migrant crisis, with the increased displacement of communities moving out on the streets, the burden was also incredibly heavy on women who were also in transit. Exposed and vulnerable on the one hand to the disease, several women and non-binary persons were forced to live in households with abusive perpetrators or travel back to households with abusive members of their family with no redress in sight. So when the lockdown happened, naturally, there was no access to shelter homes, there was no access to liaisons that could offer support, and the police, as well as medical service providers, were stretched thin. As a result, there were a spike in the number of instances where women bore the violence and continued to live on. Suicides skyrocketed and mental health impacts were also consequently high. So in the course of this time, we also noticed another phenomenon, one that's explained best by intersectionality. While overall there was an increase in violence targeting certain gender identities by certain gender identities, the intersectional realities that complicated their lived experiences, be that because of caste, be that because of class, be that because of their migrant status, be that also because of their linguistic status, depending on the state they were in, if they were away from their home states. Now, this exacerbated the extent of violence they faced. Not only were they facing violence of an immediate and an overt nature from those that were perpetrating this against them, but also the state and the system and the law and the security sector, which had already stacked up its prejudices against these communities. So when the, when the increase of domestic violence took place, we did not really have much of a political commitment. Our governments did not step up and say that this would be an issue they would address or that they would step up and perhaps offer support for survivors too. So it fell on the bureaucracy to some extent, as well as to service providers in civil society to step up and respond to these needs. And I'm going to share with you three cases. Uh, where gender mainstreaming became um, an interesting approach in the way they actually dealt with violence cases. So in a city called Pune, which is uh, close to Mumbai, those of you are, who are not from India but are familiar with Mumbai will know this. Um, so Pune went through a massive spike in domestic violence cases somewhere around March and April. And the police realized that shifting the survivor out of home was dangerous for two reasons. One, they were already vulnerable because they'd faced violence and had absolutely nowhere to go when they were shifted outside because of quarantine centers and not having local or immediate family. And two, they also faced the reprisals and the stigma if they had to go back home to get the things they needed or even access their children if that was the nature of their household. So instead of shifting the survivor out, they began to shift the perpetrator and institutionally quarantine them in spaces that were actually filled with people who tested positive for COVID. Now, while on the one hand, this put the fear of God in several perpetrators to not be necessarily violent in those times, it also led to an interesting phenomenon. More and more families that faced the instances of violence began to seek conciliation measures, began to look at mediation, began to look at the interlocution of maybe a relative or a friend or somebody who could help them address the ongoing violence in the family. Now, this was particularly interesting, but not necessarily generalizable, simply because reprisals can continue. And just because a perpetrator is removed temporarily, the larger undercurrent of violence may not be addressed. But the fact that some families went forward to seek an, a way to address the larger undercurrent really shows that there is hope for a method like this to find fruition. A second interesting case study was the National Commission for Women, which is a division that is dedicated to women's rights came up with a WhatsApp helpline, which allowed for women to just shoot a one word text message to a WhatsApp number. And depending on the state the woman was uh, uh, situated in at the time, they were able to map help and offer support for survivors in those times. But unfortunately, the downside of this is an interesting phenomenon that seems to exist in India. Perhaps in other countries, I haven't explored this, but if it's true, I'd love to know more about that separately. Uh, but an interesting phenomenon is that there are two different kinds of phones in the average household that falls in the below poverty line or perhaps closer to the low income groups. Now, this phenomenon of two phones involves what's known as the husband's phone and the wife's phone, which means the husband's phone is really the one that's, that's a smartphone, that's more accessible, that has access to the internet and data, and therefore something like WhatsApp is usable on that phone. 
On the contrary, the wife's phone is really just a functional device that allows her to make phone calls, receive phone calls, and that's about it. So in several of the instances where women tried to find help, they didn't have a device to be able to send out that text message. Now, this problem also manifested in a different reality, in a different situation where a woman tried to make a phone call to the police officers in the area when she received information through community radio telling her that anybody faced domestic violence, they were allowed to give um, the police a call and the police would intervene. Now, she made a phone call from her husband's phone when he was bathing. And at the time, the police said they would get to her. But instead of getting to her, they made a phone call back to the number and the husband picked it up. And that increased the extent of violence she had faced. So what I'm trying to say over here is that on paper, these policies may seem incredibly supportive and we have wonderful ideas to start with, but the impact fails if it's not going to be intersectional, if it's not going to acknowledge unique lived experiences. So the idea of treating women or the idea of treating non-binary people as a homogeneous group then automatically fails when you're trying to establish a strategy. Another interesting strategy that came about with civil society, and this was particularly useful because it spoke to the idea of mainstreaming strategies to address gender-based violence, was entirely civil society-led. So when the lockdown happened in my city, we reached out to civic workers who were still allowed to walk around in the city, in the streets, to support people with access to medicines or groceries, or even just give them information on the testing centers as they came up. So we reached out to the civic society, civic workers, and we said to them, if you have access to people who go to communities where there is a lot of violence, because you probably know where you see the nerve centers of violence taking place in the household, We'd like you to speak to the women there and ask them, in, through private conversations, of course, and ask them to tie a cloth outside their doors to indicate when they're facing violence. And then to take the other side of this message, which is to let the police know that if they see doors with a cloth tied outside of it, to intervene and to support and rescue the woman. So this was extremely successful because the act of tying the cloth outside the door was very innocuous. Most husbands didn't notice. Some husbands thought that the women were being clever about drying particular pieces of clothing that were not drying out already after being washed. And so they never really bothered or asked why the women were doing this. There was no fear of reprisal. And in that time, close to about 50 women found access to support, whether that was a lawyer, whether that was moving to a shelter home, or just relocating to a mother's home or a sister's home close by with the help of the police. Now, a similar strategy was adopted by the police itself in a state called Telangana, which is down south, where a police officer received a distress call uh, because she's particularly vocal about these issues on Twitter. So a survivor reached out to her and said to her that she was facing violence and she really needed a way for it to stop. Now, this survivor was in a very different city, in a very different state from where the police officer was. But she coordinated with other police officers and managed to get the young woman out of a dangerous situation. And the next, job, next task, next job that had come up was the mother of the young woman who lived in the state of the police officer asked for the young woman to be brought to her. Now, this inspired the police officer to set up what she called the mobile safety vehicle, which has successfully been able to repatriate several people, not just women, not just non-binary people, but also men facing violence in this time in the space of a family setup or perhaps with roommates wherever they were staying to actually find help and to get away from violence, at least for the temporary present, before they take larger action to get away from such situations for good. Now, when we look at these examples, and I'm still sticking with the fact that this is heavily anecdotal because research is still underway to understand exactly how much violence has happened, what nature this violence has taken, where it's been most prevalent and in what particular ways. One of the things that has really stood out in this time is civil society rising up. And the good part about civil society is that they know exactly where the shoe pinches. They know exactly what the problem looks like for them. And therefore, a strategy that they want to address a situation with speaks to their needs immediately. The thing about addressing gender-based violence is largely the sense of conflation at the policy level of gender and woman, when the truth really is that gender is a fluid identity and speaks to a massive ocean of identities and is not just restricted to woman alone, or a single idea of woman as well. So in the process of gender mainstreaming, if these examples are anything to go by, it is necessary to employ intersectionality both as a means as well as an ends to understand the impact of a mainstreaming policy. So when we're going to look at addressing certain communities, 
Centering that community is absolutely necessary. So this would be my first recommendation. Center the community you are trying to serve. Even if you're establishing the fact that certain legal regimes are in place for domestic violence or certain approaches are acceptable for filing a charge against a person who is responsible for gender-based violence, you want to acknowledge all of the challenges the survivor faces to be able to get there, to file charges, to press charges, or to even access help. So to understand that, you really need to look into examining the nature of the lived experiences of the individuals. So center the community. The second thing is to decentralize policy, to be able to allow some measure of self-governance by the community itself in addressing its needs through a mainstream lens. When I say that the political will has been absent in addressing domestic violence, I'm also trying to be cognitive and accepting of the fact that it's impossible to have a one-size-fits-all policy to address something as enormous as gender-based violence that looks so different in our everyday lives, even if we share the same narrative. So it's important to decentralize leadership in addressing something like gender-based violence to the community itself, or as far as possible, to as closely as possible to the community itself. The third important thing to bear in mind is to acknowledge the fact that certain services must remain essential regardless of the nature of the situation. We do know, and there's been enough literature, there's been enough research to testify to the fact that times of violence, times of in the form of war or armed conflict, um, times of disaster, whether that's natural disaster or man-made disaster, like the, like the times of now we're dealing with the pandemic or the, the uh, bomb blast that happened. Sorry, not the bomb blast, but the explosion that happened in Lebanon. The essence that I'm trying to bring out here is that these situations increase vulnerabilities. They take what has already existed in peacetime and then exacerbate those vulnerabilities significantly, making those inequalities exceptionally heavy to bear. So it's important to understand that this peacetime continuum that extends into maybe wartime or disaster time or emergency time automatically leads to certain communities being doubly vulnerable. And in these times of vulnerability, it is essential for certain services to remain essential, to be treated that way, to not be closed down. Domestic violence doesn't take a holiday, neither does gender-based violence of any form, and nor should access to those resources. Of course, in times like a pandemic, staffing and shelter homes can be very difficult to maintain in times like these. But certain approaches have to be thought about well in advance, taking lessons from previous instances where there have been failures or learning experiences to be able to move forward. And finally, it's always important to acknowledge that those for whose community you are creating a policy are the best judges of its impact, rather than to assume by just mere numbers. And I say this with some understanding of working with communities that have faced gender-based violence on several occasions, um, it is not enough for us to say that we've established a helpline and that's all that a survivor needs. What's essential is to acknowledge whether the accessibility of that helpline is really possible and what are the barriers that prevent that from happening. So gender mainstreaming is really not just about establishing a policy approach that you think will work for a community, but really to center that community and to acknowledge the intersectional factors that prevent that community from accessing or benefiting from those, policy, um, the, those policies. Sorry. So that is my presentation. I look forward to questions. Um, I also want to share with you at this point that at the Gender Security Project, we are mapping the instances of gender-based violence that have taken place world over uh, through what we call the COVID GBV tracker. Um, I will make sure to share the link with you on chat and we welcome organizations and individuals to look it up and to help us in the data collection process. Thank you so much for, the, for your time and for listening. And thank you, Emi Nomo, for having me. Thank you very much, Jerti Dayakuma, for that wonderful presentation, as well as for bringing, um, bringing those stories to us, especially the story you told about the community-based organization. I was able to think through innovative ways of alerting, um, alerting the police and the community about women who'd experienced, uh, who are experiencing intimate partner violence or gender-based violence and um, felt unsafe to be able to speak about it directly. Um, I think that was a very interesting example. Um, again, I would like to thank all the panelists for their presentations. And um, I see there are a few questions and answers. Some of them have been answered already by our panelists. I'm going to run through them and then, um, and then start 
um, start a discussion about some of the issues that were raised during the presentation. So I will invite all the panelists to put on their videos. And I am going to go through some of the questions quickly. And to all the participants, thank you for sticking with us um, through the presentations. And I'm looking forward to seeing more questions than the ones that have been raised already. Um, one question that is popular is um, targeted at Maya. Um, it talks about the fact that, um, and I think this is also something that applies to the other presentations we had, um, also Kerti's as well. Um, the issues about online provision of services as opposed to physical contact. Of course, that has created opportunities, but as you said, you talked about also the lack of physical contact and touch and the mental health effects that has, of course, for a lot of vulnerable populations. And this person who's anonymous has said, um, has thanked you for that um, present your presentation and has mentioned that um, they work with an abortion provider in England and they're relieved that they can continue to provide services, especially abortion services. Um, and also to be able to do that through telephone conversations and also post um, pills uh, needed for, um, for abortion. So in that way that has created an opportunity for people to provide services and reduce stigma. But she, she mentions that in relation to the health service providers, is it possible that now that, um, now that there's a lack of physical contact, um, would this not in excess lead to a, um, a reduction in the quality of care? So for example, if the pandemic goes on for a long period of time and people consistently receive services either through online telephone consultations or by mail, um, eventually wouldn't the quality of care reduce? And also wouldn't um, healthcare workers become um, fatigued by the um, constant phone call conversations and consultations they have to do online on your phone? So possibly I should, I should go first then. Um, I, I'd like to thank the, um, uh, the, the person who put the question in because I think uh, they've raised some really kind of important issues. One is, you know, about the post COVID context. So what happens, you know, when, uh, when we don't have the pandemic and how are things going to, you know, go back uh, you know, to, uh, what's the scenario uh, uh, post post COVID? And I think, of course, there is no there is no universal answer to that because it will differ uh, according to you know the different kinds of services. I guess the 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 link to abortion is really critical because the move to online has made a dramatic kind of um, uh, made abortion dramatically accessible in ways for women themselves that it didn't do before. However, as the as the um, uh, uh, the question uh, states, um, it is um, you know you still need the physical contact, and so one of the recommendations I think would be to say that you know post the post the uh, COVID um, or when we have the vaccine and when people are able to get back to clinics, etc., that we should have a combination of both you know what is best in online and what is and keeping the kind of physical uh, contact and what is best from um, face to face and i think that that is really important that online is not the you know complete panacea for for everything and there are limits to it and so i i totally agree um with um with with what is suggested by the person who asked the question, I, I absolutely agree. And, and also from the perspective, I thought the perspective from the health provider is really important here about, you know, we often don't think about uh, people who provide care, even those who are health workers, um, but, but even, even sort of in families, women are carers, etc. We don't, we don't think about their perspective and how difficult it is uh, and how it's important to, you know, for them to be, have some satisfaction because a lot of healthcare providers are particularly in say abortion services or contraceptive services and other, you know, they, they derive satisfaction from meeting the patient, from seeing them from, you know, continuities of care. Uh, the, these are really important for the providers themselves. So I absolutely agree with the, um, uh, the, the idea of keeping, uh, you know, keeping uh, uh, the uh, access uh, to physical uh, contact 
post the COVID when it's possible. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya, for that um, wonderful explanation of some of the issues um, and the nuance you added to that. I was wondering if any of the other panelists would like to add to some of what of some of Maya's comments um, regarding um, the combination of online and also physical um, service provision to make sure that we don't lose um, lose quality of care during the COVID pandemic. Okay. Um, can I respond to that? Yeah, yeah, of course, please. Uh, so I agree extensively with what uh, the person who posted that and also what uh, uh, Dr. Unitan shared. Uh, the one thing I would also acknowledge is that even when, I mean, this is entirely from India. I, I couldn't speak to anyone else's lived experience, but just really even um, the, the accessibility to help for India has never really been very heavy online or even on the phone call. It's been extensively uh, physical, like you had people walk into a service provider space or through the one-stop centers that the government has established. Uh, so this has been a huge leap uh, to expect survivors to access technology somehow or to find a way to make that information available to a service provider. Uh, so I think we as a country have a really long way to go to navigate the online space and the absence of that access has led to a huge problem for us. Uh, so I do think that we need to grow into the space of making a hybrid service available for India. No, thank you, Kathy and Maya. Those are very good points. And I think um, the fact that we're talking about creating a way of getting the best out of both solutions as opposed to focusing on one versus the other, especially given the issue of how COVID-19 is spread and how the pandemic and how Social distancing is a core component of preventing spread of um, um, the pandemic. I think, I think focusing research, focusing um, and projects and intervention projects that try and um, provide services in a way that is accessible but safe and combining um, online and physical um, approaches are probably the best um, response to this. Um, there's also an, another interesting question from Olushola Olufemi, um, and this question I think is posed to all the panelists and also to Jorgen um, specifically. It says, how does poverty intersect with issues of COVID-19 and gender inclusivity? Women are among the poorest of the poor and disabled women are even further compromised during this pandemic. Um, so, um, it would be good to get your responses on um, not just also, of course, how the intersectional issues around vulnerability and disability, but also thinking through some of the ways we can highlight the issues of women living with disabilities who are poor. Um, so I don't know who would like, Jorgen, would you like to go first? Or yeah, just, just a few remarks. Um... Obviously, I'm, I'm mostly working in the area of employment. And we, when we look at um, where do people with disabilities work, I mean, where do people in developing countries work? It's, it's informal economy, mostly. And people with disabilities are even more uh, overrepresented in the informal economy because the barriers to formal employment are so high that people with disabilities who, who, who try most of them might not overcome these barriers that are put up. So they, they, they don't have a choice and um, end up in an informal economy as entrepreneurs. And with the lockdown and, and the ongoing pandemic, the, the possibilities to earn a living um, depends on making business on the street or wherever you have your small business um, in the informal economy. So for, for anybody in the, in the uh, in, in formal economy, but including people with disabilities, these, these basic measures like physical distancing uh, are not really possible. And of course, the settings in which uh, people have to live. I mean, it's not that everybody has their own apartment or just lives with their family, right? There's these crowded places where, um, where the virus can spread easily because social distancing is, is not an option. And that, of course, equally applies to to a person with disabilities, always the gender perspective uh, aggravates the situation for women with disabilities who have um, 
of course more more stereotypes uh, they are facing more more um, direct and indis indirect discrimination of course the, the situation is then aggravated for for women with disabilities thank you very much Jurgen, for highlighting some of those issues um, i'm just wondering whether um, Muto or Maya or Kerti, you would like to add to some of the points you raised? I think Jürgen, uh, Jürgen has highlighted most of the points I wanted to raise. And the comment I type uh, in the Q&A section is, I don't have data, but I assume the intersectionality of being a female in a patriarchal society and then being disabled is likely going to be synergistic, not additive. And it's going to be more than a double Y is going to be synergistic. But I don't have data on that. Thank you very much, Mokka. And Maya, would well, you like yeah, to add something? I mean, I mean just to um, add to that, I mean, I, I, and add to what um, Jürgen and others have said, is that poverty is absolutely a factor um, in, um, in, in the way people become susceptible to disease, you know, in, in, in the factors underlying that it's part of what we call structural violence, you know, there are the, it, you know, poverty is one of the factors which make, um, you don't have, you know, you don't have to be, um, ill just because of a, a pathogen, but often the vulnerability to becoming ill is, is which, you know, poverty, uh, is a reason for makes you uh, more likely to suffer. So in in the health, you know, in in the UK and and elsewhere, uh, the people who die are most often, you know, the poorer people, and uh, the people who are affected, even in the healthcare services, you know, the say for example, you know, people who are doing the cleaning services, there was uh, no recognition of the fact that they required protective equipment as well you know it wasn't just the doctors or or the nurses but but the cleaners and um you know and i think that these are really uh, and most of the cleaners um well i i don't want to say that you know they're women and men um but so in in some context like in the elderly care homes uh there there are mostly women there and they are being affected and they weren't you know so i think i think poverty in you know in terms of is, is a very important factor. It's for it's poverty on its own, uh, and then it affects men and women differently. So that's that's thanks. That's what I'd like to say. Mm, thank you, Maya. Um, it's true. Poverty tends to increase people's vulnerabilities, and of course, also prevent access to services as well. Um, I have a point about that because I thought it was really interesting how Katie talked about, um, because we talked a lot about online access and telephones um, being a source of information, but you mentioned something about the three types of phones and how there's an assumption, of course, when you start talking about um, access to services across different settings and some countries or context, of course, everyone has a smartphone. But when you start to look at low middle income countries and also um, families living in poverty, not everyone might have access to a phone. And sometimes accessing services, whether it be for abortion, whether it be um, gender-based violence services, whether it, if it's looking for work, for example, online um, in terms of employment opportunities or information, not everyone has um, that level of access. And I would like, I was wondering if any of you would like to speak to that, like sort of um, adding more nuance to the way we think about um, provision of services. Um, so just very quickly, because something has just, you know, come up in my head. And that is that even if women, I know from my work in India as well, that yes, uh, mobile phones are, you know, accessible to uh, uh, people who, you know, live in in the slums and, you know, poor people have access to, but, but it is important to remember that that might be mediated by other people. So the women I worked with, it was often their sons who would um, uh, help them access information or make the phone calls. And, and, and so having, you know, having online access uh, or having mobile phone access doesn't necessarily um, sort of um, enable 
any autonomy always. We cannot, you know, we cannot assume agency and autonomy completely because people have or own a mobile phone. It depends who enables that access. Sorry, I'm sure Kirti has something more to say on this. No, I was just agreeing um, entirely with what uh, Dr. Unipan was sharing. Uh, it's, it's number one, it's mediated, uh, and just the, the whole permission to access it itself. That's where the mediation begins. Can you access this device? Is it permissible for you? Uh, so we've come across households that have not allowed women to even so much as touch a mobile phone, regardless of whether it's somebody else's or even the idea of having one on their own. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have women who have access to their own phones and own devices and are still facing violence in their households. So, um, you know, it, it's hard to say that there's a single sort of denominator that unites all of these experiences, but just really access itself is heavily questionable um, across the board. And just, I, I, I was wondering um, also for, um, Jordan and also Muta, in terms of um, access to opportunities, because um, Jordan, you talked a lot about um, the fact that people living with disabilities, in, in addition to not having access, usually not having access to employment opportunities, they were further stigmatized um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then when you put on, when you also think about the intersectional layer of poverty and access to information and services, even if there, they have, even if there is information about their rights, um, could, could you please speak to some of these issues regarding um, all the different um, using an intersectional lens, all the different levels of vulnerability they face in terms of accessing information, accessing um, employment opportunities as well. Yeah, just um, one of the points I had on the slide, and sorry, it didn't move at the beginning, and thanks for Emily, Emily Loma to take over the slides. Um, the key point, of course, is um, access to information about the pandemic. And we had webinars here in the ILO where we heard from different countries, for example, in Nepal, where also wrong information was uh, circulating in the disability community because it was not the, the general information was not clear from, from the government, from um, authorities in charge. But then, of course, if you then don't get the, the information in a format that, ex, that is, is accessible to you, if, you, for example, you get flyers, but you are um, visually impaired, severely and visually impaired or blind of course that flyer is not um, helpful unless you, of course you have a have somebody close to you a family member or assistant who can read out that information um, when it comes and we, we talked about or, or for example then the intersectionality with uh, indigenous people because we heard for example from the latin american region but of course, Spanish and well, um, Brazil and, uh, and, and Portuguese in Brazil, but obviously it's, it's uh, mostly a, a Spanish speaking continent and countries um, in which uh, Spanish is so uh, dominant. But when you then talk about poverty and indigenous people, indigenous people not having the education to speak uh, and understand Spanish, uh, and they, they don't get the information they need in um, in their local language, indigenous language, uh, then thinking about people, indigenous people with disabilities. So that created at the very beginning, and I assume still a, a lot of um, confusion, fear, anxiety, leading to men mental health conditions in addition to, um, to pre-existing disabilities. Um, so that's this, the, the language diversity, of course, is, is essential, including for people with disabilities. Um, we, we mentioned digital accessibility or um, information through smartphones, websites, that's uh, where in, in regions where you don't have such a digital divide and people usually would have access to the internet. The question then is, is for example, a government website, is it accessible if I use assistive software a screen reader or would it just give me a number of, or, or like a long list of errors and I, the information cannot be processed? So, so um, there are very many ways to look at the accessibility of information, communication, and all of them need to be addressed to make sure that nobody is, is left behind.
thank you very much, um, Jorgen, um, Kirti and Maya for your responses. I think those are very important points you raised. And I, I see that we're running out of time. We have a few minutes left. So I'm going to focus on two more questions that were raised by the participants. Um, one question is from Sujit, and this is actually particular for Maya, but I think it's also very relevant to Mukta's um, presentation as well. Um, and it's also a question I had myself. Um, the person talks about the fact um, on the line system failures, and I imagine this is speaking to health systems as well as um, as well as social systems, social infrastructure, implementation of human rights principles and data that um, has largely exacerbated the magnitude and intensity of the COVID pandemic. And this person says this, of course, this is more obvious in low middle income countries. And you can see that as the disease has become more of a global pandemic, you can see that a lot of countries with more resources are able to respond better than other um, countries with less um, social infrastructure and resources. And um, this person says it's specifically true for India, but I, I want to extend this to also some of um, some of the points raised by um, Mukta in Nigeria as well. And um, the question is first about um, the fact that there's a paucity of research in many low middle income countries on COVID as opposed to um, um, more resource um, countries. And also, um, there's very little evidence about the impact on maternal health, health and antenatal care, especially in the context of India and other countries like Nigeria. And this person, I think this, this um, participant is asking for you to share findings, but I think it's also an opportunity to reflect on, um, first of all, the issues around um, COVID-19 has sort of turned the way we think about the state, state control, access to health care. Um, it's posed new questions and new rules that a year or two years ago would have thought were impossible to implement in terms of rights, um, human rights. And I, I also want to include reproductive justice because that was a very good thing you, I, you brought up, Maya. So it has, it has sort of questioned um, the boundaries of those um, what we call human rights and what is reproductive justice. And also, um, because of resources, we don't have enough evidence from all these countries about how to, um, what, are, what is the impact and how to improve responses. So I would like um, probably Maya and, of course, and Mukta and all panelists to kind of respond to this question about moving forward, what are the best ways to address some of these gaps in data and um, um, intervention? Yes, thank you. And I think, uh, Sujit, that's a really um, kind of pertinent question coming from India. Uh, the interesting thing is that the Indian government, as far as I've seen, has been um, very responsive in terms of the language of the policies. And I'm thinking about maternal health, where, for example, I was um, you know, quite um, surprised and pleasantly surprised to find that there is a push for, say, things like abortion, and there is an acknowledgement of this in the public, you know, domain of health policy and planning. However, I also know that in India, there is a huge gap between policies and actual implementation and what's happening on the ground. So reports from uh, different members of, of our research center have shown that um, that has remained in policy language. That in fact, and again, we go back to the pre-COVID situation where abortions have never been accessible uh, in India. And they are completely kind of uh, entangled with this kind of debate around sex selective abortion and the and and the criminalization of sex selective abortion and so that has led to in fact you know pre covid situations where abortion itself is regarded as something negative that people are not encouraged to access anyway it's extremely difficult so then you come in the covid situation and the indian government has said we must have access to abortion it must you know, because women should have the right to have children, but also not to have children. Um, and, and I think that, uh, it, and, and so the policy is actually excellent. But 
there is there is nothing on the ground to show for it and and what then is the link between policy and uh, how to then translate that into action in what there is there is again lack of evidence on you know what what kind of incentives have been given to healthcare providers on the ground to facilitate this um and and i would in terms of the research that's happening again it is research institutes civil society organizations civil society organizations in india are not only about action and activism and campaigning they do a lot of research as well and that boundary is important to recognize because a lot of civil society organizations and research of established organizations is included in government policy in fact government policy is based on civil society kind of uh, recommendations now um, in terms of uh, certain interesting research that has emerged on this i would i would request sujit please on our course website uh, if you look at the blog section we have some really important blogs on uh, by some important uh, people in civil society such as yashodhara das gupta who's written on the maternal health care situation and particularly in relation to abortions and systemic failures that are appearing on the ground uh, because of this um, and and linked to this again i would go back to the earlier question on um, sort of online access and also to kirti's response to that to say that you know um, um, you know the the fact that we are having um, a move to online uh, provision um it, you know that is not it may be it may be wonderful in the uk but that it actually uh, you know removes completely access to a lot of people in in contexts like india uh, and that's again uh, coming up in some of the reportings that we have uh, in our on our blog site so i would just i would just point sujit to to if he could look at that he would find that really interesting thank you thank you very much maya and um i see there's another question about girl child specific issues um um which we'll quickly respond to but i also see we are running out of time and um i wouldn't want us to extend beyond the allotted time so i would ask um, one of the panelists to just respond to that and then um I, I want to reassure all the participants that a video will be made available also you will get a summary um of the of this webinar so um, a minute like um, document also with presentations made available um so don't worry we will include information about that also, um, I say consulting will also provide a, a summary policy brief that includes some of the responses that have been provided during this webinar and a bit more information on approaches to gender, mainstreaming, and social inclusion. Um, so I will now ask if any of the panelists um, would like to respond to the question about girl, um, girl child issues that have risen during the COVID 19 pandemic. Um, um, okay, um, okay, then I will respond to that. So, um, um, since, oh, the question has, wait, the question has gone, but I think the COVID pandemic has obviously has, um, um, affected, um, vulnerable populations and not just women, but also children, especially with the school closures, um, there's some research, but not a lot, um, to be honest, that talks about some of the increase in domestic violence um, and children who suffer abuse in their homes, but are usually able to access some sort of respite in schools or are able to talk to people outside their family about some of their problems. The COVID pandemic and the subsequent school closures have sort of affected our access to resources. And resources. Um, we can take it for granted, of course, um, in a lot of um, in a lot of contexts, the female child is often disproportionately disadvantaged, and um, the COVID nineteen pandemic just exacerbates some of those vulnerabilities that we usually face. Having said that, um, um, I, I think I'm also drawing from Mukta's presentation. That is not to say that male children are not also affected, but they are often affected by different sorts of vulnerabilities. And I think the question is to um, include some of this in our research and our projects to focus not only on 
gender differences to thinking men and women and also um, people of um, people of different sexual orientations, but to also think about how this affects children as well and, and the specific vulnerabilities. And I think returning to school is not just one solution. We need to think deeply about, because in some countries when the um, infection rates increase and the mortality and fatality rates, schools have been closed down again. So we have to think about interventions that are sustainable beyond just sending kids back to school and how to integrate that into already existing responses. Having said that, I see it's now 3.59, and I would like to thank you, a big thank you to everyone who has stayed through the presentations and also the discussion and people who've posed questions. I also want to thank the panelists for making out time to talk through some of these issues and to give a very nuanced, um, no one's perspective on some of these key issues around responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and for more information about this webinar and subsequent webinars as well as minutes will be available on the ICA website and this will be shared. And I would like to thank you all for your time. Thank you. Goodbye and a good day to all. Thank you everybody, bye-bye.